All right, first problem, order of operations. All right, order of operations said that we have to do the grouping symbols first. So I'm going to go inside the parentheses, and inside the parentheses, I had to do the multiplication first. So 4 times 2 is 8. Then I'm going to go over to the next parentheses, and I'm going to do 7 times 5, which is 35. The rules, I have to finish what's in the parentheses. So I'm going to write this 8, and then inside, I'm going to do 7. I'm going to do the same thing on the next one. I'm going to have 35 minus 22, which is going to give me 13. And now I have two multiplications. And I have to do the multiplications before I can do the addition. So 8 times 7 is 56. 3 times 13 is 39. And now I have to add 56 and 39. So let's do it over here. So my sum is 95, and my answer to my problem is going to be 95. All right, our next question is still order of operations, but now we have exponents involved. All right, remember what you have to do in order of operations. You have to do grouping symbols first, then exponents, then multiplication or division, then addition or subtraction. The other thing you have to remember with this is that the numerator and denominator are implied grouping symbols. So you have to take care of the entire numerator and the entire denominator before you can handle any kind of other operation. 6 squared is 36. 5 squared is 25. That's my numerator. My denominator has a grouping symbol, 6 minus 5. That's 1 to the second power. Now I'm going to translate that, so I'm going to have 36 minus 25, which is 11, over 1 squared, which is 1, and that means that my final answer is going to be 11. What's going on? Again, I use the exponent for 6, which is 6 to the second power, 6 times 6, minus the 5 times 5. And then I did the uh, 6 minus 5 in the denominator to the second power, which was 1, and I have 11 over 1, which is 11. Okay, now we have to do the prime factorization of 198. Prime factorization means I can only use prime numbers as factors of the given number. And uh, we have a couple of different ways. Most people use something called the factor tree. First thing. 198. Now I need two numbers that when multiplied will give me 198. 2 is the obvious choice because it's an even number. And 99 would be the other choice because 2 times 99 is 198. Now I need two numbers that will give me 99. Now 2 is already a prime number, so I'm going to just leave that there. But 99 is going to be 9 times 11. That's 99. Now 11 is a prime number, and I need the prime factors of 9. So I'm going to do that with 3 times 3. So now the prime factorization of 198 is equal to 2 times 3 times 3 times 11. Uh, but all those numbers are primes. The other thing we can do with it is I can use an exponent for the 3 and make it 3 to the second power. You also should become familiar with the first 10 prime factors or the first 10 prime numbers. All right, we now have an inequality and they want to know which of the inequalities is portrayed with the number line graph. Okay, now I'm going to take a look at it. What I have to remember is this. Where I have an open circle, that means that the symbol is going to be either less than or greater than. If I have a solid dot, it means that it's going to be less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. So now I have an open circle, so I know I'm dealing with one of these two. And what I've just done is eliminate the answers B and C because it's not a solid dot. 
The other thing I look at is do I need numbers that are greater than negative 5 or less than negative 5? Well, the line is going to the right, and all these numbers are greater than negative 5. So my answer, my correct answer is going to be A, because X is greater than negative 5. The sign in A is, is greater than. The sign in B happens to be is less than. And C is equal to. What is the relationship between negative 13 and negative 5? Well, if we had a number line, we could see that negative 13 is to the left of negative 5. That means that negative 5 is greater than 13. That's our correct answer because negative 13 is less than negative 5. All right, number 6. We're now dealing with another of order of operations question. Well, let's see. We get 5 times 6 minus 2 plus 7. Now, I had to do the division first because the division was to the left of the multiplication. Now I would have to do the multiplication, which would give me 30 minus 2 plus 7. Now, 30 minus 2 is 28. When I have addition and subtraction, I just have to go from left to right. So that's going to be 28 plus 7, and my final answer is going to be the sum of the two, or 35. All right, now we have something involving absolute value. Try and remember the definition of absolute value. Remember that absolute value is the distance a number is from zero. And distance can never be negative. So the absolute value of negative 165 is going to be 165, because that's how far negative 165 is from zero. We now have another order of operations. Uh, number eight has brackets. That's not absolute value. They are brackets. So be careful with that. A bracket is a grouping symbol. Now what you want to know is why they didn't use parentheses. Well, that's because they have negative numbers. And when we have a negative number, oftentimes we put the negative number in parentheses for clarity. So we don't have two signs back to back without anything separating them. So we have to be very careful with that. So our first grouping is negative 6 plus negative 9. Our second grouping is 11 plus negative 5. And before I do anything, I have to figure out those two sums. I'm going to keep the bracket. Negative 6 plus negative 9 would give me negative 15. Now, because there are two negative numbers, I simply add and use the sign of the two add-ins. With the next bracket, first of all, I have the plus sign in between. I have to keep it there. I have positive 11 plus negative 5. The signs are different, so I have to subtract. And 11 take away 5 is 6. And it's going to be a positive 6 because 11 is greater than negative 5. And that's the sign I have to use. I'm just keeping it in a bracket so you can see what's actually taking place. Now, the last number I have to put in is negative 10. Now, by order of operations, I have to add going from left to right. So the first thing I'm going to do is negative 15 plus 6. Negative and a positive added means I find a difference. That would be 9. Now, the sign of 9 is going to be negative because the 15 is greater than the 6. And in reality, I'm dealing with absolute values of those numbers. Now, negative 9 plus negative 10 is going to be the sum of the two numbers, which is 19. And it's going to be negative because when I'm adding two like signs, I add and keep the sign of the add-ins. Number nine, we have a fraction raised to the fourth power. What are you doing when you're raising any value to a power? So I'm going to have one over negative four times one 
over negative 4 times 1 over negative 4 times 1 over negative 4. And how do I multiply fractions? Straight across. Very good. What's 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, okay? And then I have negative 4 times negative 4 times negative 4 times negative 4. What I like to do is deal with the signs first. A negative times a negative is positive. Times a negative would be a negative. Times the last negative would make it positive. Okay, and I'm going to have 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, which means that I would have 4 times 4 being 16, times 4 would be 64, times 4 would be 256. So my answer is going to be 1 over 256. Now what you have to be careful about when you're multiplying fractions that have 1 in the numerator is that you have to keep the 1 in the numerator. You can't get rid of it. And the 256 is in the denominator. So my fraction is a very, very small fraction, 1 over 256. We're back to that order thing again, only this time we have decimals. How do you compare decimals? When comparing decimal numbers, we compare place by place. Now, oftentimes it's easier if you think of it as money. And in order to compare it like money, we'd have to have the same number of decimal places. So if I have this, how can I make it dollars and cents? What do I need to the right of the nine? A zero, yeah. Okay, and now if you take a look at that in terms of the other one, which would you rather have? The 1890 or 1848? And that's always a quick way of doing it. Whichever one would be bigger is the one that you would want. And that would mean that A is going to be our correct answer. All right, we have another question. Well, this one says that we have to round a decimal to the nearest tenth. In order to round numbers, whether they're whole numbers or decimals, you need a good uh, idea of what place value is. So in our number over here that we have, the 0 0.87, the 0 is in the ones place. The 8 is in the tenths place, and the 7 is in the hundredths place. Our number is 0 0.87. Again, the 0 is in the ones place, the 8 is in the tenths place, and the 7 is in the hundredths. So I am rounding to this place right here. What that means is I have to look at the digit to the right of it. The digit to the right happens to be a 7. What that means is I'm going to add 1 to this place, and then everything else to the right becomes a zero. So my answer is going to be 0 0.9. What if there was a 9 where the 8 is? What happens then? Yeah, it would become 1 or 1 1.0. Number 12. The other thing you have to remember is when we're operating with decimals, we have to maintain our place value. We can't simply put numbers wherever we want. We have to respect the place value, just as if they were whole numbers. All right, let's go ahead and try the problem. Whenever you have a multiple choice on your test, you should work out the problem before you even look at the answers. Now, this says that I have 9 and 4 tenths minus 7 and 3 tenths. And I'm going to subtract just as if they were whole numbers. I had to put 9.4 over 7.3, keeping the 3 under the 4. That's going to be a 1, my decimal point, and 9 take away 7 is 2. I now have 2.1 from this operation. What I'm going to do now is add 8.5, again, keeping my place value consistent, 5, 6, 8 and 2 is 10, and my answer is going to be 10.6, which means that my correct answer was letter A. All right, number 13. Again, it's order of operations with decimals. Be careful. 
All right, let's take a look. What do I have to do first? Well, I have to take care of the grouping symbol. So this is a grouping symbol, this is a grouping symbol, and then I have to multiply the values. So the first thing I'm going to do is take 14.9 and add 12.2. Again, just as if there were whole numbers, I'm keeping my place value intact, and I'm getting 27.1. So that's my first one. The second one is a subtraction problem. And I have 18.7 minus 15.1, and that's going to give me 3.6. So now my multiplication is going to be 3.6 times 27.1. So I'm going to do 6 times 1, 6 times 7, and I carried the 2, and 6 times 2 is 12, and 4 is... 16. I am now going to multiply by the 3, but I have to be careful. Now, I like to put a 0 over here when I start going to that second number that I'm multiplying. That helps remind me about the place value. 3 times 1 is 3. Uh, 3 times 7 is 21. I'm going to put a 1. And I'm going to cross out this 4 and put a 2 over here. 3 times 2 is 6, and 2 is 8. So I now have my partial products, and I'm going to add them. A 6, a 5, a 7, and a 9. Now I have to put the decimal someplace. Where do I put the decimal? Well, I can't. I have one decimal place over here. I have one decimal place over here. 1 and 1 is 2. That means I need two decimal places in my answer. So I'm going to put the decimal point between the 7 and the 5. So my answer is 97 and 56 hundredths. Our next question gets involved with something that we love, percents. And they're asking two questions in one in this case. They're saying 78% is equivalent to what simplified fraction? 56% is equivalent to what decimal value? One of the things that we have to remember when we're dealing with percents is that percent literally means parts of 100. So when I have 78%, it is going to be 78 over 100. And what I have to do is simplify that fraction. They want it simplified, so I need a common factor for 78 and 100. Because they're both even numbers, I'm going to divide each by 2. And when I divide each by 2, 78 divided by 2 is 39. 100 divided by 2 is 50. And I like to check my work. And what I do is I check the prime factors of the numbers I'm dealing with. 39 is 3 times 13. 50 is 2 times 5 times 5. 3, 13, and... 2 times 5 times 5 means there are no common factors. So the fraction 39 fiftieths is in simplest form. So now we have to change 56% to a decimal. Now when changing a percent to a decimal, I know I need two decimal places. So 56 would be a whole number. So I'm going to move my decimal point two places. From here, it's going to here, and then here. So 56% is going to be 56 hundredths. And again, think about what you say. If I said 56 hundredths to you, and I didn't write it down as a decimal, you would write 56 over 100. So it's very similar to what we did with the 78%. I'm going to skip this because it's the same question again. All right, now we get to use the percent. What is 65% of 160? Now, most of the time when we're doing percent problems, we're translating from English into mathematics. Because what is by itself, I'm going to treat that like it's a variable. So I'm going to say x, the word is means equals 65%. I'm going to change to a decimal, and 160 is just 160. So my problem becomes 6,500 times 160. And that's going to give me the answer to my question. 
Now, one of the things we have to realize is that we can never operate with a percent. We have to change a percent to a decimal or a fraction in order to operate with it. And we have to keep that in mind all the time. So my problem is 6,500 times 160 is going to be a zero, another zero with a three, and that's a five and an eight. Then I'm going to multiply by the six, but I'm going to put my zero here as a placeholder. Six times zero is zero. Six times six is 36. And I'm going to see if I can still get my three there. Six times one is six, and three is nine. I'm now going to add my partial products. I'm going to get zero, zero, 14 carrying the one, and that's going to be 104. And now I have no zero, uh, no decimal places in that, excuse me. Two decimal places here still gives me two in my answer. So I'm going to take my decimal point, move it over here, and my final answer is going to be 104 is 65% of 160. Now we have a word problem. And the word problem is really a comparison of fractions. It's an order of fractions question. Molly completed 5 eighths of her homework, and Max completed 4 sixths of his homework. Who completed the most homework? Now we have to pick one of the signs. Greater than, less than, or equal to. And we're comparing fractions. Now we have several different ways we can compare fractions. So you just have to pick one. One of the ways to compare fractions is to change them both into decimals because it's easier for us to compare place value than it is to do this. Another way to compare fractions is by finding a common denominator and equivalent fractions. So let's take a look at that. So my first fraction is 5 eighths. My second fraction is 4 sixths. Now what's a common denominator for both 8 and 6? So we now have 5 eighths equals something over 24, 4 six equals something over 24. Now, way back when, about 800 years ago, when I was in sixth grade, I had a sixth grade teacher who told me to use a backward Z to figure out equivalent fractions. And what he said was 6 goes into 24 four times, and 4 times 4 would give me 16. And I did the same thing with the 8. 8 goes into 24 three times, and 3 times 5 would give me 15. Now, just so that you know that what he was basically telling me is that 5 eighths, and if I multiply the numerator and denominator by the same number, I would get 15 over 24. And that's the mathematical reason why it worked. But I always remember the backward C. Sometimes nonsense things like yeah, that help us to remember things. Uh, same thing is true with 4 6. I had to multiply both by 4. And that's equal to 16 over 24. Now, it's important to know, what's 3 over 3 equal to? 3 over 3 is equal to 1. And what's 4 over 4 equal to? What happens when I multiply something by 1? It stays the same. The only thing I'm doing is changing the name. So I change the name of 5 eighths to 15 over 24 and change the name of 4 six to 16 over 24. So now, what is going to be the relationship? Is Molly's homework greater than Max's homework, less than Max's homework, or equal to Max's homework, less than? So I would pick over here, I'd put it in less than. One of the problems, so I'm going to give you a quickie on this here. You change 5 eighths into a decimal by dividing 8 into 5. And my sixth grade teacher told me that too. He said, you have the 5, dive into the swimming pool, and then you divide by the denominator. So little silly things like that help you to remember. Now you have to put a decimal point and a couple of zeros. Now 5 eighths is 0.625. 4 six, when you change that to a decimal, is 0.6666. Uh, six, 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 and it repeats. So you can tell in that point too that 0.666 six, six, six is uh, greater than 0.625. It's actually point six, uh, six seven. Now another way of doing it, and this is something I like to do, so I'm going to show it to you, 
if I have five eighths and I have four six, I like to use something that I call a sweetheart. I take the denominator on the right and I multiply it times the numerator on the left and that gives me 30. And then I take the denominator on the left and multiply it times the numerator on the right and that gives me 32. And if you take a look at that, 30 is less than 32. Now just so that you know that I'm not doing something that's not mathematically correct, basically what I found were numerators that I'm comparing of like fractions, the common denominator in this case then would be 48. But it's a quick way of checking things if you'd like. Now the reason I call it the sweetheart because it kind of makes a heart. Now we get to do addition of fractions. What do you need to remember when you're adding fractions? I can't add them unless I have a common denominator. In other words, they have to be like fractions. If it was subtraction, I still have the same problem. I need a common denominator. All right, what's a common denominator for 3 and 7? All right, again, I use, I told you about it, my backward Z thing. So I say 7 goes into 21 three times. 3 times 6 is 18. 3 goes into 21 seven times. 7 times 8 is 56. All right, once I have like fractions, I'm going to add them. My denominator stays the same, 21, and I'm going to add the numerators. That's going to be a 4, a 7. Now, 74 over 21 is in simplest form. It can be stated as a mixed number, and you would do that by dividing 21 into 74, but it can't be reduced. Oh, now we have a division of fractions. Well, you can't divide fractions. What you do is you try and find an equivalent expression and multiply. And finding an equivalent expression is easily done by finding the reciprocal of the divisor. In this case, the reciprocal of the divisor is going to be negative 11 twelfths. So now we have a choice. We can turn around and we can simply multiply. We talked about multiplication before when we had our 1 over negative 4 to the fourth power, that we multiply across. Well, I can do negative 4 times negative 11, which is going to give me 44, and then 9 times 12, which is going to give me 108. And then I have to realize I can reduce that because they're both even numbers, and it says that I have to have them as a reduced fraction. Now, what's a common factor of 44 and 108? By the way, a negative times a negative is a positive. I forgot to mention that, so just so you know. I wasn't disregarding the signs. All right, so what am I going to divide 44 by? What am I going to divide 108 by? Now, just a little word here. What's 4 over 4 equal to? 1, and when we divide by 1 or we multiply by 1, we don't change the value of the number. So I'm going to change the appearance of the number, and in this case, it's going to be 11 over 27. And that is in simplest form. Now, when I had my negative 4 over 9, and I had the negative 11 over 12, I could have done some canceling. I could have said that 4 goes into 4 one time, and 4 goes into 12 three times, and then I would have reduced prior to multiplying, and I would have had negative 1 times negative 11, which would give me positive 11. And then I would have 9 times 3, which would be 27, giving me the same answer. But if you don't recognize that you can cancel, go ahead and multiply, and then reduce your fraction after you multiply. All right, now we have another fraction question. All right, so we're simplifying. So this is just, again, order of operations. So what do we need to do first here? the exponent, right? Because, of course, with PEMDAS or GEMDAS, whichever one you use, you do the exponent first. So we're going to do 3 over 5 squared. So I'm going to write that over here. So we have 3 over 5 times 3 over 5. And what is that going to leave us with? 9 over 25. Excellent work. So we have 7 over 2 minus 9 over 25. 
And then in order to subtract, what do we need to get? A like denominator, um, common denominator, right? So we have 2 and 25. So what's the common denominator between those two? 50. Excellent. Because they don't have anything in common, so you would just need to multiply the numbers with each other, all right? So this fraction, what do we multiply it by? By 25, right? So then we're going to do that to the top as well. And then on this fraction, we're just going to multiply that by 2. All right? So over here, so that's going to be 35, right? And then 14 plus 3 is 17. So we have 7, 175. And then 9 times 2 is 18. So we just subtract the numerators, carry, because 5 is smaller than 8. So then 15 minus 8 is 7. 6 minus 1 is 5 and 1. So we have 157 over 50, and that cannot be reduced, right? So for this one, it says simplify. So we're first going to do what? The parentheses, right? But we can't really do anything there. So what do we need to do next? Multiply. We're going to distribute this negative 3 into the parentheses. So we have 6 minus 3y minus 33. Make sure that you are very careful about those signs, all right? So now we need to combine like terms. So what are our like terms here? The, 30, the negative 33, right, and the positive 6. So those are different signs. So what do we need to do with those numbers? We need to subtract them. So 33 minus 6 is 27. And what's the sign of that 27 going to be? It's going to be minus because the negative was the bigger number, right? And then we just bring down the negative 3y. So your answer would be negative 27 minus 3y. And of course, you can also write this as negative 3y minus 27. Just make sure that you keep all of your values, all of your terms, the sign that they were before. All right? So we're going to subtract 5 from both sides so that we can get rid of this 5 right here. All right? So over here, these cancel out, right? Positive 5 and negative 5 just becomes 0. And then we have negative 5 minus 5. Those are the same signs. So we add the numbers up. Gives us 10, and it stays negative. Bring down your equal sign. Bring down your 2x. All right? And now to isolate the x, we have 2 times x, right? So what do we need to do there? We need to divide by 2. Very good. So those will cancel out. And x equals negative 5. So for this one, this is an evaluating question. So that means that you just take the values and plug them into the um, expression. So we have 9. And then w is negative 4. So we're going to put that in parentheses over 5 times p, which is negative 5. So on the numerator, we have 9 times negative 4, which is negative 36, right? And on the denominator, we have 5 times negative 5, which is negative 25. Now, this doesn't simplify, but what can we do with these negatives? What happens with those? It becomes a positive, exactly. They disappear, they cancel out, they become positive. Because whenever we have a negative divided by a negative, it gives you a positive answer, all right? So our final answer would be 36 over 25. So here we have a formula, right, where H is the female's height and W is her weight. So it says if Carissa is 68 inches tall, what should her weight be according to the formula? So where are we going to plug in this 68? into H. Very good. So we have W equals 105 plus 5 plus 5 times 68 minus 60. All right? Equals 105 plus 5 times, we do the parentheses first, right? 68 minus 60 is 8. And then what comes next? Multiplication, excellent. So we have 105 plus 40, which equals 145. 
So Carissa's weight should be 145. So it says, it should actually say translate the following words, right, into an algebraic expression. So it says twice the value of y. So how would we write twice something? It would be two times something else. So we first would have two multiplied, and then it says the value of y. So that would just be two times y. So when it says translate this into an algebraic expression, your answer would just be 2y. All right? So let's go on to the next one, number 26. So it says Miranda and Kim were putting up some fencing across their ranch. They know that for every 135 feet of fencing, they'll need nine posts. So we're comparing feet to posts, right? So our first fraction is going to be 135 over 9, which is going to be equivalent to Let's keep reading. Which of the following proportions is set up to correctly find the number of posts? So the number of posts, we're going to represent that with what? X. All right. So that's going to go on the bottom, on the denominator. Will it take up, take to put up 210 feet of fencing? So that goes right there, 210 feet. So now, the way that I always like to do proportions, rather than actually solving it, I'm going to check of these proportions has x diagonally across from 135. So I'm going to go through each letter choice and see which of them matches, all right? We only need to check if the x is diagonally across from the 135. So for our first answer, that has x diagonally across from 210. Is that what we wanted? No. So that one doesn't work. The next one has x diagonally across from 135. So that is what we wanted, but we're going to keep checking anyway just to make sure. The next one has x diagonally across from 210. Doesn't work. And then the last one has x diagonally across from 9, which again does not work. So our answer is going to be B. This one it actually wants you to set up a proportion and solve it. So it's going to be miles that we're comparing to hours. So it says, James jogs four miles in two hours. How many hours, so that's going to be x, right, will it take James to jog 32? So then we can just cross multiply here, and then that will give us our answer once we solve the equation, or that will give us our equation to solve. So we have 2 times 32, which is 64, equals 4 times x, which is 4x. All right, so to solve for x, we just divide both sides by 4, right? Which will be not 8. It's going to be um, 16. 64 divided by 4. So I can do that on the side right here for you. So that would be, goes into it once. Bring down the 4. 4 goes into 24 six times. So x equals 16. So it takes him 16 hours to jog 32 miles. All right? It says, find the area of a rectangle with a length of 19 centimeters and a width of 13. So let's draw our rectangle, label it. So we have a width of 13 and then a length of 19. Now, what's the formula for area? Length times width. So what do we need to do with these two numbers? We just need to multiply it, right? So 13 and 19. So 9 times 3 is 27. Carry the 2. 9 times 1 is 9, plus 2 is 11. So now we put our placeholder. 1 times 3 is 3. 1 times 1 is 1. Add it all up. We get uh, 247. So the area is 247 centimeters squared, or square centimeters. All right? Does that make sense to everyone? All right, awesome. Remember, area is everything that covers inside here, all right? When they ask for something that goes around it, around the rectangle, that's perimeter. So the formula for perimeter is different. Number 29, it says Kelly made a circle in the snow. So there's my attempt at drawing a circle, all right? <laughs> the circle has a radius of seven meters. All right, so radius is what type of measurement? It's half the diameter, right? So diameter is 
all the way across the circle, right, from the center, and then radius is just from the center to the edge. So the radius is seven meters, right? What is the area of the circle she made in the snow? So what's the area of a circle? Good. So the area is pi r squared, right? So like we said, we're going to plug in these values. It gives us what pi is, right? Pi is always 3.14 unless they want to give you a different value. So 3.14 times 7 squared. All right, so we have A equals, let's do the exponent first. A equals 3.14 times 49, and then we're just going to multiply that. It says round your answer to the nearest tenth, so, so your answer should be 153.9 meters squared. Again, it's always squared when you have area. All right, so it says convert the measurement, 9 kilometers equals how many millimeters? So we can actually do this with a proportion, all right? So I would say kilometers to millimeters, and then we have 9 over x, and we can find the conversion factor from this conversion table, all right? It tells us that one kilometer is 10,000 meters. So we need to actually keep substituting back all right, to find out how many kilometers is in, or how many millimeters is in one kilometer. For one kilometer, we have, and then for one meter, we have 100 centimeters. So we're just going to add two zeros to the end to that, all right, because we would be multiplying to get back to centimeters. So now we're in centimeters, all right, and we're going to convert that to millimeters, which there are 10 millimeters in one centimeter, so we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for millimeters. All that I did was I multiplied each time to get back to millimeters. All right? So I'm now going to put this right here. That looks like it's 10 million. And then to solve this, we just cross multiply. So we will have 90 million millimeters for one. That would be 1x, right? So then x, the answer is 90 million.